Right, so before we start, can we just have a round of applause for the massive MacBook Pro tower that we built here? But on a serious note, I have six, yes, six Apple MacBook Pros here on the desk in different sizes from different years and with different overall specs that I'm going to pit against each other to see, number one, just how far the M3 series has come. And crucially, if you've got an older version of a MacBook Pro, are the new ones worth the upgrade? Now, of course, even though I have six machines here, I don't have every single possible configuration available for the different years of MacBooks, but some of the results are very interesting indeed. So we have the brand new 2023 16-inch M3 Max in the new Space Black, a 2023 14-inch M3 Pro in Space Black, a 2023 16-inch M3 Pro in Silver, a 2023 14-inch M2 Max in Space Grey, a 2022 16-inch M1 Pro in silver, and a 2019 16-inch Intel i9 in space grey. That's a lot of Macs. Now, Apple made such a big deal about comparing the new M3 series chips to the M1 and the Intel versions that I thought not only should we test this, but also how the M2 series fares against the new models to ascertain whether there's a reason why they didn't really compare the two during the launch. Now, to be a bit more specific, the 16-inch M3 Max has a 16-core CPU, 40-core GPU with 48 gigabytes of unified memory and a one terabyte SSD. The 16-inch M3 Pro has a 12-core CPU and an 8 18 core GPU with 18 gigabytes of unified memory and a 512 gigabyte SSD. The 14 inch M3 Pro has an 11 core CPU, a 14 core GPU with 18 gigabytes unified memory and a 512 SSD. An M2 Max has a 12 core CPU, a 30 core GPU with 32 gigabytes unified memory and a one terabyte SSD. The M1 Pro has a 10 core CPU, 16 core GPU, 16 gigabytes unified memory, and a two terabyte SSD. And finally, the 2019 model has an eight core Intel i9, an AMD Radeon Pro 5500M with 64 gigabytes memory and a two terabyte SSD. Now, because of these variations, some of these tests may differ slightly from some of the test results that you would get depending on how you spec your Mac up. But this video should still help you get a rough idea of what you might expect performance wise. Now, before I run any tests, I checked the resting temperatures of the machines, all of which were running similar, with the M3 Max seeming about a degree warmer, but the Intel i9 was already running a good few degrees hotter, something that this machine in particular has always struggled with. This thing, as soon as you turn it on, has pretty much always been a furnace. In fact, I used to use it as a radiator during the cold winter months. So first up, we ran a simple CPU Geekbench test on all of them. Now, many refer to the CPU as the brains of the machine and is important for deciding how fast programs can run, the speed of browsing the internet, creating documents, spreadsheets, etc. The more traditional everyday functions of a machine. The M3 Max scored a large 3,226 in single core and a gargantuan 21,469 in multi-core scores, which is crazy. The two M2 Pros pretty much matched it in terms of single cores with 3,200 and 3,194 respectively, but were crushed on those multi-core scores at 14,461 and 15,680. Very similar multi-core scores to those two from the M2 Max at 14,791, with the single core score dipping below the 3,000s at 2,714. So the M3 Pros here seem there or thereabouts with the M2 Max from just January this year. The M1 Pro that Apple seemed to compare a lot to in the M3 series launch scored 2,402 single and 12,487 multi, so nearly half the score in just two years. And then the Intel i9 was absolutely obliterated, scoring 1,584 and 7,259. Now the GPUs that we also compared against each other within Geekbench are for your more niche specialized performance tasks graphics, rendering, the likes of gaming, video editing, Photoshop, etc. And the M3 Max with its 40 core GPU had a 91,000 open CL score, which was over double the 14 inch M3 Pro score and just under double the 16 inch M3 Pro. The M2 Max fares better than the newer Pro models with an impressive 76,377. And interestingly, the 16 inch M1 Pro with its two core less GPU scored pretty much much the same as the M3 Pro 14 inch at 42,216. Again, as expected, the 2019 Intel machine is lagging with 30,730. Now, next up, we ran a Cinebench test to also put the GPUs 
on the chopping block. And while this is running, I'm going to again see the temperatures of the models using my trusty gun. And as you can see, whilst all are now running warmer than at resting, to be expected, obviously, both Max models are running significantly hotter than the Pro variants, with pretty similar temperatures to the Intel machine. I can't really hear any of the fan noises from any of the MacBooks, however, other than, again, the Intel version, which is whirring away like a little trooper. The M3 Max did join the Intel model with audible fan noise in a quick multi-core CPU test on Cinebench, but the 16-core CPU machine did noticeably come out on top with a beastie 1688, over 50% more than both the M3 Pros and the M2 Max models, all around 1000, with the M1 Pro and Intel dropping off the scale with 833 and 513 respectively. Now, a lot has been made about the fact that the new M3 chips allow for hardware accelerated ray tracing. So in-game lighting, for example, can look much more realistic, make the game feel far more immersive. But what about overall gaming performance? Well, the 3D Mark test, which is designed to compare the 3D graphic rendering performance of machines, typically gives you a fairly good idea of possible gaming performance. Now, this is only available for Macs that have the M series chips inside. So unfortunately for this, the 2019 Intel model is out. The M3 Max has an overall score of 13,362 and an incredibly stable average frame rate of 80. The M3 Pro 14 has an 11,442 with a slightly less stable 68.5 the 16-inch version of the M3 Pro was surprisingly quite a bit better than the smaller model at 12,963 and 77.6, but the M2 Max was almost identical to the M3 Max. It did a brilliant job here. And finally, we start to see the fall off from the M1 Pro again with 9,482 and 56.8. Now, if you are a creator, you might want to know how these machines are going to handle video editing, Photoshop, all of those types of software programs. So the next two tests might aid you in that decision. Now, the first is a slightly unoptimized program. It's really designed more for iOS than macOS, but it should again be helpful for you. This software is called Blackmagic Disk Speed Test and helps to show you the read and write speeds for different resolutions and frame rates. Now, this program just runs and runs and runs until you select it to stop. So it kind of gives you a constant ticking over of the machine and the scores will vary as it's going through, but they'll be there or thereabouts every single time. The M3 Max seemed to be just around 6,500 megabytes per second write and 5,000 read. Both M3 Pros had similar read speeds to that, but significantly lower write speeds. The older M2 Max was on average better than those two on the write speeds at around 6,100, and the Intel had a measly 2,000 write and 2,500 read. But the biggest anomaly here of all was that cheeky M1 Pro, which scored 7,000 write and nearly 6,000 read higher than the M3 Max. Next up, I used Blender Open Data. I know this is a popular program for creators. And again, and this has been a fairly reoccurring theme throughout, the 16-inch M3 Max absolutely tore the others apart with around double the scores of the M2 Max, which was ultimate peak flagship just 10 months ago. So there's a lot to take in here, but it seems from certainly these tests anyway, the M3 Max for starters is a pretty mind-blowing jump indeed in just a matter of months. The M3 Pros seem great, but they certainly are much more understated. If you do have an M2 Max, I wouldn't say you need an upgrade to an M3 Pro, as the performance will be largely similar and in some cases possibly worse. But certainly if you are on an M2 Pro or M1 or, well, definitely an Intel machine, the M3 Pros are definitely looking like they're a jump worth taking. But my biggest takeaway here is that if you have the money and are desperate to upgrade, the M3 Max really is a bit of a no-brainer. That jump is hugely significant to pretty much every single other machine that they've made. And again, it's just the time frame that they've made that jump that is so hugely impressive. I wouldn't say if you had an M2 Max, it is an essential upgrade, but niche activity dependent for you, you might need all that insane power if you want to shell out another 
three and a half, four grand. I'm not sure I would for what I do if the M2 Max was my daily driver, but the improvements are black and white. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. What do you think of the new M3 series MacBook Pros? Is the M3 enough? Are the Pro and Max variants a big enough jump for you from previous generations, or would you like to see them do more? If you did enjoy this video and found it helpful, a like would be much appreciated, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. My name's Adam. You've been the best as always. I love you and leave you. I'll see you in the next one. Tsby1T. Peace out.